sure that you already know that the COVID numbers have risen dramatically these past several weeks here in the Fresno Clovis area. We as a church have received countless calls from families within our congregation that have COVID and have asked for prayers. If you yourself don't have COVID right now, you know someone who does. And this has not only affected people within our church, but also within our volunteers, within our staff, and within our leadership. And it is at, out of an abundance of caution that we are gonna be moving our in-person gatherings at Bullard High School to only online for the next two Sundays. And so on Sunday, January 23rd, and on Sunday, January 30th, we have all online services. You can find those at prodigalchurchfresno.com or on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes podcast, or on the Prodigal Church app. We're praying for God's peace, blessing, healing over you and your family in this season. Grace and peace.
based on that video, uh, do you know which fruit of the Spirit we're going to be looking at today? Joy. Joy. Uh, we're in week two of our fresh series, and we are immersing ourselves into the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. If you have your Bibles, check those out right now. It says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Got those memorized yet? Uh, joy, the thing that we're focusing in on today, it's something that we all need more of, amen? Joy and happiness, so many in our world, so many in our community aren't experiencing joy and happiness. How do we do this? How do we uh, get joy? Every talk show host, every self-help book, every magazine cover has steps. Seven steps to joy, five steps to happiness, three steps to your best life now. If you were to Google search how to be happy, how to have joy, you would find 846 million results in less than a second. Go to the bar, get drunk, meet other miserable people, that'll make you happy. happy. Every product commercial says, buy our junk and you'll be happy. It's all subtle ways to try and quench our thirst for joy. I saw a commercial the other day for dishwashing liquid. In the opening scene had a woman standing over sink she was disheveled. She was tired. There were countless dirty dishes in there. Uh, uh, the kids were running around the house. The husband's probably watching TV. And the one standing over the dirty sink looked up to God as if to say, how can this be happening to me? And then the new dishwashing liquid was introduced. The magic graphic uh, had the bubbles living with smiles. And as they tackled the dirt and grime on those uh, lasagna pans that the lasagna wouldn't come off, they're scrubbing them off perfectly. And after that, the woman's hair was done. She was down 20 pounds. Her kids were doing their homework. And the husband was holding her around the waist um, as if they were a junior high couple at lunch. Is this commercial really about dishwashing liquid? When you break it down, the subtext, it's saying something like this, like use this dishwashing liquid and your problems will go away. Your kids will behave and your spouse will be more into you. And it's not true. I have three cases of stuff in the pantry of my house, okay? They're, they're not selling soap, they're selling happiness, they're selling joy, and I want my money back. People think that if they can just get the right person or the right thing, they'll be happy. True, lasting joy and happiness isn't something that we can find from this world. The great author, theologian, philosopher C.S. Lewis wrote this in his book, Surprised by Joy. Joy is an unsatisfied desire, which itself is more desirable than any satisfaction. It's so deep and so true, and perhaps by the end of this sermon, we might have the smallest inkling of what it means. Joy never comes through seeking joy. Pleasure works that way. You can get pleasure by going out tonight and seeking pleasure. Joy doesn't come that way. Joy only comes through seeking something other than itself. It's a byproduct of love. Today, we're going to spend some time in the book of Philippians, and this book is a book all about joy. And like Galatians, the letter to the Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul in the first century to an early group of Christians. Philippi was an important city in the ancient world. Um, it was in northeastern Macedonia, right on the Roman highway. And while writing this, Paul is in jail in Rome. And so as we read parts of Paul's letter this morning, he's not writing from his study overlooking a beautiful countryside or sunset. No, he's in a Roman prison with barely enough necessities to survive. Paul was a man who had every reason not to be happy, and yet throughout this letter, he is filled with joy, not based on his outward circumstances, because those were terrible, those were horrible, those are worse than whatever we might be going through right now and yet he was filled with joy. Over 18 times in this short four chapter book, Paul talks about rejoicing or joy. And I encourage you to read all four chapters. We're not gonna have time today, but it'll take you maybe 20 minutes. So sometime camp out in Philippians sometime this week. The word joy in Greek is chiron. 
means to be cheerful or calmly happy. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Calmly happy. It comes from a confidence that even in the midst of adversity, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of troubles and trials, God is present. Look at verse three. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God and I pray with joy. And that probably isn't a natural thing for Paul, but when he thinks of these people, he gives thanks and he prays with joy. Let memories move you to prayer. Every time he thought of them, he prayed. Memories can become so vivid in a moment of remembrance, Paul hinted that such memories can put energy into our prayers. What would that look like for us? Today, the teller at the bank reminds you of a friend from long ago. Pause and pray for that friend. When a kid on a bike reminds you of a grandchild, pray for that grandchild. When a song reminds you of an old boyfriend or a girlfriend, pray for that person that you once couldn't get out of your mind. When someone's voice reminds you of another friend, pray for them and also pray for the person that is reminding you of them. Let your memories spark an engine of prayer in your life. It doesn't need to be an audible prayer, right? Because that would be weird. Oh, you're in real estate. My friend Aaron is in real estate. Lord Jesus, I pray for my friend Aaron. And I thank you for Aaron that even as I'm reminded by this gentleman here who's also in real estate, what's your name again? Okay, Matt. Even as I'm reminded by Matt, I pray for Aaron. No, that would be strange and weird. Uh, but God listens to our heart. Pray it silently. God hears what's in our minds. Or when you maybe you get back into the car, pray for Aaron and then maybe pray for this real estate agent named Matt as well. And as you do this, prayer becomes a more natural part of your life and you begin to experience more joy. Joy becomes a more natural part of your life. Jesus becomes a more natural part of your life. Look at what Paul says in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul said that everything that has happened to us helped spread the gospel, the good news. Not just some of the things that have happened to him, not the, the good things that have happened to him. Paul said all these things have happened and it spreads the gospel. And that includes the fact that he's locked in a Roman jail. How painful it must have been for Paul, yet he confesses that all of these things have helped further the good news of Jesus. Uh, this part of the Bible that Paul wrote is written in the Greek language. And the word he used here for to advance the gospel is prokopi. And it means to drive forward. It's, it's the beautiful picture of pioneers cutting through uncharted territory to make a way. Sometimes the stuff we're going through, the season that we find ourselves in, it's a season of cutting through trees, creating a new path, a path for you, a path for others to take you to a place that you never dreamed possible. Making our way to uncharted territories so that we can get to the other side, something much better. In the middle of darkness, Paul chooses to look at the bright side how it furthers the good news of Jesus. Do we look at the bright side? And there always is a bright side, right? What about this season of life that you specifically are in? What about it can be bright? What about it will you miss years down the road? Perhaps you're in a season of isolation. And so you're all in one house and there are a lot of things to to think about that are negative about whatever situation. But the closeness, the proximity, the amount of time that you're able to spend together, perhaps that can be a bright side. Perhaps you're taking for granted something now that you'll miss later. Lean into the good because it is there. Or perhaps in your season, in your situation, the stuff that's going on in your life, you think there is no bright side. Maybe your bright side is that this season will end that it won't always be this way. And we have that promise and that assurance in God's word. God will work things out and bring about goodness and love and grace and his good news. 
just the, the temporary aspect of your season might be the bright side. Or the beauty of God and nature that he created can be the bright side. Sometimes we have to go outside and literally smell the roses. Find a flower, find a pine tree, find a dandelion, find a rose bush, and literally stop to smell the roses, to see the beauty all around us, to see the miracle of life itself. Sometimes we literally have to go outside and smell the roses. Look at the vastness of the night sky. All of these things can help us live a greater life of joy. Sometimes we just get lost in the shuffle of life, of day to day. At the market in Mexico City, there's an ancient fable about a man named Pot Potalamo. And he had 20 strings of onions that he would sell. An American tourist asked him, uh, how much for a string of onions? And he says, 10 cents. How much for two strings? And he says, 20 cents. How much for all 20 strings? And he goes, well, I will not sell you all 20 strings. Well, why not? Aren't you here to sell onions? And Pota Lamo says, no, I'm here to live my life. I love this marketplace. I love the crowds. I love the birds. I love the sunlight and the wavering palmettos. I love to have friends come by and say, buenos dias, and talk about their children or their babies or their crops. That is my life. For that, I sit here all day with my 20 strings of onions. But if I sell all my onions to one customer, then my day has ended. I have lost the love in the life that I have, and that I will not do. I think we have much to learn from Pota Lamo. The Apostle Paul opens up about the season that he is in in verse 13 of chapter 1 in Philippians. He says, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. The reference here to palace guard is literally Praetorian guard. These were 10,000 hand-picked soldiers by Caesar Augustus himself. They were strategically dispersed throughout the Roman Empire to promote peace and protect the emperor. The chains that Paul refers to in verse 14 were about eight in 18 inches long. One end was attached to the prisoner's wrist and the other to the guard. The chain wasn't removed from the prisoner as long as he was in custody. This made escape and privacy impossible. Those soldiers would have been relieved after every few hours, but they would have this constant companion chained to their wrist. Who's Paul going to talk to all day? Well, the guards. And what is Paul going to talk to them about? Ah, it's, it's Jesus. Paul is saying that in the middle of this season, in the middle of being arrested in Rome and being chained to another person, for 24 hours a day with no privacy and constant pain and chains, it has become clear to the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. How we handle adversity testifies to the light of God in your life. Paul shined Christ to these soldiers. In the last part of the letter to the Philippians, Paul writes this in chapter four, all the saints send you greetings especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Oh, there are Christians now in Caesar's household? How? Well, Paul talked to the guards, and then the guards talked to others, and before you knew it, they were baptized believers in the house of Caesar himself. You see, it wasn't Paul who was chained to the guards. It was the guards who were chained to him. Here's the remarkable part. Instead of seeing the soldier as an inconvenience, Paul saw him as a captive audience. They couldn't get away. Paul's message was compelling because Paul's character was compelling. His life in chains, in a jail cell, with barely enough to survive, his life demonstrated love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. For two years, one soldier after another was chained to Paul, and that served as an opportunity for him to advance the gospel. 
Paul's character and demeanor would influence them because Paul lived as a free man even though he was in chains. Prison couldn't defeat him, chains couldn't bind him, walls couldn't hinder him. His joy was not based on outward circumstances, is yours, is mine. Does, does my joy go up or down according to whether I have a good day or a bad day? I want the kind of joy that Paul has, the, the kind that Jesus offers, this abundant life, this joyful life, the kind of joy that is not based on outward circumstances, the kind of joy that can be experienced even when chained to Praetorian guard in a Roman jail. In this season, January of 2022, there is worry. There is fear, there is anxiety, and I get it, but there can also be joy. There is always a deeper good, a better reality than the reality that we ourselves are experiencing. This was true for Paul in a Roman jail, and it's true for us wherever we may find ourselves. Comedian Dimitri Martin puts it like this. Uh, you see a picture here, uh, just a person, uh, a hand throwing or catching a ball. But if you add just one line, now it's a man reaching for a doorknob. You see, one tiny stroke of the pen changes the whole scene. We'll add one more line and then rotate it, and now it's a man drowning at sunset. Just a small line, just a flip of the script, and it's something completely different. Let's take this one step further. Add one line, then another. Now rotate it, and it's a man drowning at sunset and God reaching down to help him. You see, just one small line, one small stroke of a pen that seems so insignificant, one flip of the script, and things can dramatically change in our circumstances. It's true for us. Joy, joy. The quote we read from C.S. Lewis, joy is an unsatisfied desire, which itself is more desirable than any satisfaction. Now, I wanna nerd out on you guys just for a second, so hang with me. C.S. Lewis also writes an essay called Meditations in a Tool Shed, so you know it's good. See, he had this experience one day where he was in a dark shed and a sunbeam came through uh, a crack in the door. He writes that he could see the beam of light, but he couldn't see things by the beam of light. Have you ever had that experience where you're in a dark room, the door barely opens and a beam of light comes in. You see the beam of light, but you don't see the things that it could illuminate or where it's from. Lewis goes on to say that that is how so many of us experience happiness or pleasure, whether it be a new relationship, a wonderful meal, a promotion at work, some delight. Those are all good things, but that is looking at the beam of light. Lewis says that if you want to know joy, you can't look at the beam of light. You have to look along the beam of light. You have to follow it to its source to see more beyond the brief beams of light in a tool shed. He writes, when I did that, instantly the whole picture vanished and I saw no tool shed, no beam. Instead, I saw through the top of the door green leaves moving on the branches on the tree outside, and beyond that, 90 million miles away, the sun. Isn't that beautiful? Do you hear what he is saying? We must not stop at our momentary moments of happiness or fleeting pleasure, but we must look at them and look along them, beyond them, to their source, which is found in Jesus. One more verse. There is this interesting interaction between Jesus and his disciples in John 16. And Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish 
because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. She remembers her pain no more. Notice, it doesn't say that her pain is gone. It's not gone, okay? After she has a baby, the pain is not gone. I have witnessed this before, but when the child is born, her pain's not gone, but she remembers the pain no more. She remembers the pain no more because of the joy of the new life she has in her arms. It's like that story, uh, Mary and, and Elizabeth. M Mary is pregnant with Jesus and her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist and they meet each other. And it says this in Luke 1, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby inside her leaped. Skirteo, it means leaped for joy. The baby leaped for joy in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a connection between the Holy Spirit and joy. And then in Psalm 96, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. If the fields, if the trees, if the babies inside of wombs leap for joy, why can't we? There is so much to have joy about. You have the God of the universe who knit you together in your mother's womb, who loves you, has a plan for you, died for you, sacrificed for you, and calls you to his mission in this world. We have so much to be joyful over. The cross, the salvation, the abundant life that we have in Jesus. In a good God who calls us closer to him and with open arms runs to us even when we run away. God loves you. God has a plan for you. God has called you into his mission of love in this world. That way we can bring heaven to earth, not just abandon earth and get to heaven. But yeah, help God's will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. And that brings about joy. God, I pray in Jesus' name that wherever we are, Maybe we're at home in isolation. Maybe we're on a walk. Maybe we're in our car. We can all think of things in our lives that don't bring about joy. But God, may you help us draw that one line. May memories bring us to prayer. May a change in perspective, may we remember the joy that we have, the good things in our lives, the, and the God in our life. And may that transform how we look at our perspectives, how we look at our situation, how we look at the jails we find ourselves in. May we experience joy. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us online at Prodigal Church Fresno. I want to remind you that next week is also a, a all online service. And so we hope and look forward to seeing you online next Sunday for week three of Fresh Peace in the Middle East.